Shall we turn now in our Bibles to the 28th chapter of Acts, verse 23 and 24 of Acts 28. Paul has realized a ambition of a long time. Paul had been desiring to see Rome. And when he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was sharing with the elders of one of the churches his desire, I must also see Rome, he said. And now he is in Rome. This dream is fulfilled. Even as the Lord had come to Paul and said, you must also testify of me in Rome, Paul is now in Rome ready to bear witness for Jesus Christ. Probably he is not there as he was hoping to be, as just a free tourist, but he's there by courtesy of the Roman government. He had made an appeal to Caesar when he was getting the political runaround in the courts of Caesarea, and so he is waiting in Rome for his opportunity to make his defense before Caesar Nero. Paul has been allowed to rent his own house. He's been allowed to have visitors come and go freely. And so while he is there in Rome, he called together the elders and the leaders of the Jewish community there because he wanted to have a clear understanding with them that he was not there to make any scurrilous charges against the nation of Israel, but just to explain to them the situations that prompted his appeal to Caesar. And so they said, well, we didn't even know anything about you. No letters have been sent to us, and so this whole thing is, is news to us. But tell us. This, this sect of Jesus, what do you know about that? <laughs> and that's, of course, all that Paul needed. Uh, he appointed them a day to come uh, that he might share with them the truth about this sect of Jesus. And so in verse 23, on that appointed day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Paul was expounding to them and testifying to them from their own scriptures concerning that kingdom that God had promised. That day that would come when man would be relieved from the miseries and the sorrows and the sufferings and the pain. And they would enter into a glorious new age when the glory of God would cover the earth. And so Paul was sharing with them the scriptures concerning that promised glorious kingdom age. But you cannot have a kingdom without a king. And so not only were there promises of the glorious kingdom that was to come, but there were many descriptions of that king that was to come to reign over the kingdom. And so Paul began with Moses and went through the prophets as he expounded unto them and testified to them the things of the kingdom of God. And as Paul was relating to them all of these glorious promises out of their own scriptures, he no doubt began to refer to the king that God had promised was going to come. For the kingdom that was going to rule, the king that was going to rule over this kingdom 
was going to be born, according to the prophets, in the city of Bethlehem, and he was to be born of a virgin. For in Isaiah chapter 7, God had said, I will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And Micah had said, And thou, Bethlehem, though thou art little among the provinces of Judah, yet out of thee shall come he who is to rule my people Israel, whose goings forth has been from old, even from everlasting. So the Eternal One, Thou art God from everlasting to everlasting, we read in the psalm. The Eternal One was going to come into time. He would be born in Bethlehem of a virgin. And according to the prophecy of Isaiah, he would be the Son of God. Chapter 9 of Isaiah, he said, For unto us a child is born. That's looking at it from the human side. Looking at it from the divine side, he said, Unto us a son is given. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. For upon the throne of David he shall order it and establish it in righteousness and in judgment from henceforth even forever for the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. And so the king is coming. He'll be born in Bethlehem of a virgin. He will be the Son of God, a child that is given to us. And he would come into history 483 years after the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. For Daniel, the prophet of exile, who lived in Babylon after the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, was told by the angel of the Lord that there were 77-year periods determined upon the nation of Israel. And from the time the commandment would go forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, the King, would be seven sevens and 62 sevens or 69 sevens times or 69 times 7, 483 years. So the time of the coming was given. And in 445 B.C., when Artaxerxes gave the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, all you have to do is mark your calendar on the 483 years, and it brings you out to when Jesus came and made, as Zacharias said, his entry on a donkey into Jerusalem. Rejoice. O daughters of Zion, shout for joy, for your king comes to you, but he is humble, he's lowly, he's sitting on a donkey. And so his entrance, 483 years after the commandment was prophesied, the king would step out of eternity and into time, and he would live and dwell among men. And yet... According to Zechariah, the king would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. For Zechariah said in chapter 11, And name the price for which I was prized of them, and they counted out for my price 30 pieces of silver. And I said, a great amount to be offered for me. And he said, cast it to the potter in the house of the Lord. And so Paul, no doubt, was showing how that though he would make his triumphant entry, he would be despised and rejected. He would not be received by the people. Daniel said the Messiah will be cut off without receiving the kingdom. And Isaiah in chapter 53 said he would be despised and rejected by men. 
and would be numbered with the transgressors in his death. So not only was he be, to be despised and rejected, he was to be numbered with the transgressors, but he would rise from the dead. And so as Paul went on and gave all of these interesting, amazing prophecies concerning their king, he then sought to persuade them that Jesus was the promised king. No doubt pointing out the time of Jesus' coming, 483 years after the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Pointing out that he was born in Bethlehem of the Virgin Mary. Pointed out that Judas Iscariot betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver, which was later cast down into the house of the Lord and then used to buy a potter's field. Pointing out that he was crucified as was described in Psalm 22 when they pierced his hands and his feet and they parted his garments among them and cast lots for his vesture. And as Paul began to show to them the prophecies concerning the king, he sought to persuade them that Jesus was indeed that king that had been promised. He fulfilled the requirements in the prophecies. Now there were other prophecies of that king, prophecies of the glory of the kingdom that would be established. These prophecies await their fulfillment when that king comes again, his second time to reign over the earth in glory. I reject and I resent being called a doom and gloom prophet because I declare that Jesus is coming again to establish God's kingdom upon the earth. For as I read of this kingdom in the scriptures, I read where the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth. I read where righteousness will cover the earth as waters cover the sea. I read where wars will be abolished. I read where men will dwell together in harmony, in peace and love and partake of the fullness of the earth without commercialism, without cost, without price everybody being able to share together in the fullness of the earth. I read where crime and corruption will come to an end. I read where there will be no sickness, no pain, no sorrow. I read where the lion will lie down with the lamb and a little child shall lead them. I read where the deserts are going to become like lush gardens. And I read where Jesus is going to reign where'er the sun doth her successive journeys run. And that is not doom and gloom. That's glory. The glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth. It's going to be utopia. It's going to be Shangri-La. It's going to be the kingdom, golden kingdom mage. A time of glory and blessings undreamed of by man. Hey, if I were a doom and gloom prophet, I'd just read the paper for you. <laughs> you talk about doom and gloom, look around you. What are we going to do? We are facing an enigma that nobody has the answers for. I am convinced that the Democrats don't have the answers. But I'm also convinced that the Republicans don't have the answers, nor the independents, nor anybody else. Government is too big, too bulky, and too expensive. We cannot afford it anymore. In fact, just to stay in business this year, they have to spend $200 billion more than they take in. Now, 
how long could you go on with that kind of fiscal irresponsibility? Well, this year, you know, we to pay our rents and to pay our utilities and all, we're going to have to borrow, you know, a million dollars this year to get by. <laughs> well, how many years can you go on borrowing that before you have to pay the piper? So, these fellows work extra hours trying to figure out new ways to put a tax bite on you. Some new item that they can tax. They need more money to support the new programs. I mean, where's, where's the stop? And we can't seem to solve the social problems. We're living in a world of pain. We're living in a world of sorrow. We're living in a world that is suffering. A world that is filled with wars and threats of wars and saber rattlings, greed, exploitation. Hey, that's doom and gloom. I'm telling you that these days are short-lived. They're soon going to be over. That man has seen the tragic results of rebellion against God. But the king is coming very soon. And he's going to set up a new kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness, the kingdom of God's glory and blessing upon man and upon the earth. Oh, I'll tell you, not doom and gloom. It's the only hope that I can see. And the Bible tells us that as Paul spoke to them all day long of these things, some of them believed and some of them believed not. That's always the case. You see, there can be people sitting side by side exposed to the same truth and some believe and some believe not. As the truth of God's word is spoken, people feel sort of a little fire beginning to burn in their hearts as the Spirit kindles faith and they believe. Others just sort of reject it. They say, well, I can't believe that. Really what they're saying is, I don't want to believe that. If I believed that, then I would have to alter my lifestyle. I don't want to change my lifestyle. I enjoy living after my flesh. I don't want to believe that. Such is the case. People can be equally close to life and equally close to death. And some enter into life and some die. We remember when, according to the scriptures, Jesus was crucified between the two thieves. As the scripture said, and he'll be numbered with the malefactors in his death. And so a thief on either side, and one of them said, Hey, fella, if you are the Son of God, why don't you come down off of that thing and save us? And the other one turned to his buddy and said, Hey, knock it off, man. Don't you have any respect at all? We're here because we deserve to be here. But that man hasn't done anything wrong. Leave him alone. And turning to Jesus, he said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, would you remember me? And Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, these two fellows were both equally close to Jesus close to life, and they were equally close to death. They were both of them hanging on crosses, dying. One was saved, one was lost. One believed, one believed not. 
Always men are divided into one of two categories. This morning, you lie in one of these two categories. When Paul had sought to persuade them concerning Jesus, some believed. Some believed not. This morning, as we have sought to persuade you concerning Jesus, some of you believe. Some of you believe not. But have you ever considered the consequences of not believing? First of all, there are glorious results that accrue to the person who does believe. The Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He that believeth on the Son of God hath life. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believed on his name. So you who have believed in Jesus, God has given to you the power to become a son of God. And you have that hope of eternal life with Jesus Christ. And you have the hope of living with him in his glorious kingdom that he comes to establish upon the earth living and reigning with him in his kingdom, the hope of every child of God. But to him that believes not, he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God will abide upon him. And in Revelation 21, 8, for the fearful and the unbelieving shall all have their part in the lake which burns with fire, for this is the second death. Some believed and entered into life. Some believed not and went on in the hopelessness of darkness. Jesus one day said to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And if you live and believe in me, you'll never die. And then he said, Martha, do you believe this? He had made an extremely radical statement. And then immediately he challenges her, do you believe this? And it follows that, yes, there are those who do believe that, and there are those who do not believe that. But you're one of the two. You, you all exist in one of two categories. Either you believe concerning Jesus Christ, that he is indeed the king that God promised and sent into the world who is coming again to establish God's kingdom. And you have that hope and that thrill of waiting for our Lord to come. Or you believe not and you live in hopelessness and despair as you look at the world and realize there is no way out of its dilemma. And some of them believed, and some of them believed not. Now, I can give you scores of good reasons to believe. But for the life of me, I don't know of one single good reason not to believe. Now, maybe you have one, and if you do, I wish you would share it with me. I don't know of one good reason not to believe in Jesus Christ. You may have reasons, but let me tell you something. They are very shallow. They are very empty. They are only excuses. They're not really a good reason. And you will discover that to your own dismay when you stand before God and you are questioned by God as to why you did not believe. Well, Lord, there were so many hypocrites in the church. And so many churches, I didn't know which one to believe in. 
and, and you'll realize, ooh, man, that's not a good reason. No good reason not to believe. But oh, I can give you scores of good reasons why you should believe in Jesus Christ. So Paul told them the truth, the whole truth, the nothing but the truth. And it was up to them to believe it or not. Even as it is up to you today to believe it or not. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you have left a very clear record in your word and in history. Sufficient evidence to cause us to believe. So that we rest not in a blind faith, but we rest on the sure foundation of your word, knowing that Jesus indeed was the king that you promised who came, born of a virgin, as you said, died and rose again, as you said, and who is coming again, as you said, to bring God's kingdom to this earth, which is destroying itself as it continues to rebel against you. God, I pray today that your Holy Spirit will, by your word, light a fire in our hearts. Spark the faith within us. And may we, O oh God, use that faith to believe in Jesus Christ as King. Amen. Each man for himself must determine whether he is to believe or not to believe. And it is a choice that you must make. I choose to believe because of the evidence that I see. I choose to believe because there's no other hope that I can see in the world today. I choose to believe because it makes sense. I choose to believe because it satisfies me and brings me great peace and great comfort and great joy. Now you may choose not to believe and you have that prerogative. Though as I say, I don't know a single good reason not to believe because that means that there is no hope for the world. That man is only going to increase his destructive capacities until one day he unleashes them and this whole thing will go up in a cloud of atomic dust. What a hopeless world we're living in if you don't know Jesus Christ. Believe it or not, that's up to you. I would encourage you today, if you want to just submit your life to the king, you be, want to become a citizen of his kingdom. Just bow your knee before him and ask him to take control of your life. 
Or maybe you think that you know better how to run your life than he does. There was a time when I thought that. You know, someone said too soon old, too late smart. I can look back. You see, I'm at that point where I can look back further than I can look ahead. And I can look back and see where I made some rather foolish mistakes because I sold some property too soon. I didn't know what the market was going to do. Oh, if I'd only held on to it. And then I bought at the wrong time because I didn't know what was going to happen, you see. If I'd only known I could have made better decisions. I don't suppose you've made that mistake, but I have. And I find it very comforting to place my life under the control of someone who does know the future. And thus my future is secured in him. And I love it. I love walking with Jesus Christ. I love serving the Lord. I love the peace and the joy and the excitement of my life. That same peace and joy that you can know. God bless you and God be with you. And may the Spirit of God just really work in your heart in a very special way that you might begin to understand how much God does indeed love you and that you might begin to understand that rich future that he has prepared for those who believe in him and who will trust him. May God give you a beautiful week walking with you guiding and directing you according to his will. In Jesus' name.